man thank you so much for um for coming on the podcast i really i i know it's such short notice like just with university and whatnot i'm trying to fit it all in and i do it mostly on a friday and finally i don't have to go into uni today so Ah, i'm like oh okay cool Um, nice so yeah look thank you so much for um for coming on doing this because uh yeah i know you're a very very busy busy person um Mm. but yeah let's do this sorry why isn't it Cool. I think we're ready to roll. Yeah. Yeah. So as I was saying, yeah, thank you so much for coming on the podcast with me and um, taking time out of your afternoon to do this with me. Pleasure. Um, so look, like, uh, you know, how we sort of connected was, of course, through social media, uh, the mm-hmm. double-edged sword. <laughs> and, um, you know, you sent me this really nice little paragraph and it just goes to show, you know, for you... You're you're an expat from Australia, so you you know if you want to start off with that, like why why did you move to LA? Why 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 the big move? Yeah, uh, for me, travel has always been uh, something that I've been interested in. Living in different countries, uh, mm. I've also been in the entertainment industry, and I lived in Lo- uh, London for uh, four years. I was a professional dancer, mm-hmm. um, and so I was living over there and I came back to Australia after that stint and lived in Melbourne for a while, then Sydney. And then I was pursuing more acting uh, things and LA kind of seemed the, the, mm. the natural sort of progression from that point. So uh, after I'd met my wife, we got married and then we moved over to Los Angeles and, and we've been over here for six years now. We're in our seventh year. Mm. Um, and LA is one of those funny places that you feel when you first go there, it's a little bit grimy. It's yeah. not that really attractive. There's lots of smog. The beaches aren't anywhere near as nice as Australia. And so initially, you know, in yourself, like, why am I here? And then you realize that it's just uh, um, so many opportunities. There's every corner, every meeting that you meet, there's a, another opportunity Mm. or an inspiring person to connect with so Mm. it's very it's one of those um social environments where you're constantly being inspired Mm. uh, and wanting to to get more out of your your chosen career or network or if you've got a Mm. dream or a you know an idea um so that's really good and then and then there's just so many other opportunities that, that you're not aware of but being in that position and that location allows them to happen and and for me that was i got a job working for a fitness company um called ifit mm-hmm. nordic track is their main um the one that most people know yeah yeah yeah. and then i um so then we moved out to utah where the their studio was and so i've been filming uh live content and video content teaching uh treadmill and, and bike classes with them and that's the kind of opportunity that you would never ex- mm. expect to get and it was one of those jobs where um, it was a, an audition it was downtown in LA and I was running out of time and it was in the afternoon and my wife was like, Oh, what's the point? And I was like, yeah, and then I'll just go and see what happens. Anyway, I, I got the, I did the audition and, and then I, I got the job. This was four years ago. Mm. And so I've been flying out here ever since filming and, uh, it was just one of those jobs and opportunities that you would never get if you had mm. not been in Los Angeles. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's sort of what took us there. And at the moment we won green cards. So we're going to be here at least for five years and then we could get citizenship. Um, but I think also the, um, the political status here and the social mm. environment of, of, of the U S is, I think when we first got here, it was quite a, um, a sense of pride to be here and, and mm. a lot of people wanted to be here. And now it, it's certainly losing its, its, its tarnish and its appeal. It's like, oh, it's almost a little bit more. And it's kind of almost embarrassing to be here in some respects mm-hmm. um, with what's going on politically. Um, so, but again, this just, it's such a beautiful country and so much to see yeah. and do. And, um, you know, Australia will be home one day. Yeah, no, that, that, that's amazing because, um, you know, like I just 
the way I relate to that is my my dad used to live not in the states but you know South Africa and he, he just he just stayed there because he loved it and he said there was so much more opportunity so what you're saying there just makes a lot of sense and I completely understand that now mm. no to unpack what you just said you're a very very accomplished person so <laughs> professional dancer right so if, if like we'll get into the ultra running because that that like again you've completed two out of the three uh 200 mile um yeah destination races is the the company yeah, that yeah they do them yeah um so i've done moab and uh, most recently did tahoe and bigfoot is the the third the third one yeah um so and that that'll that's going to happen not uh 2024 i think that'll be okay. that so that just to, um, so for the audience, um, there that's two hundred and forty miles for the Moab two forty and two hundred miles for Tahoe two hundred. So that's three hundred and twenty kilometers and three eighty, three eighty six. Shit, that's a long way. So we'll get into that. But you know, so you've moved there. You're a professional dancer. You're a, per, you know, you're, you're a fitness presenter. You've got two children, a wife. Mm. This is where I, I just want to get straight into it. Mm. As someone who has done and is doing a lot, what does balance mean to you? How do you balance? Because the way I, I word it is that there's no such thing as balance. It's just a chaotic mm. balancing act. You know, you mm. put a lot of energy here into your kids, but you you know you don't put as much into training or or your job. Or so, how do you personally do everything? Because you you you're doing and have done so much. Yeah, um, I'm definitely not an A-type personality, so I don't like plans and mm -hmm. I don't uh, prepare <laughs> sometimes to my detriment. But for me, uh, having a, a very fluid um, mindset where I'm able to just um, take an opportunity when it presents itself and then when things aren't presenting itself, being okay with just being in the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm kind of in that situation now where work has died down and I'm sort of, you know, sitting around going, okay, well, you know, how am I going to start uh, pivot, pivoting from here and what am I going to do next? But I think when you, when you, and this is something I've always been doing, I'm just very intuitive into what I know make, brings me joy and what brings me happiness and I think when you have an ability to have a North Star and understanding that, then no matter how busy, crazy your life gets, the term balance is structured in a, a North goal of what makes you happy and what things are satisfying. So I think overall I'm always doing things that are bringing me joy or happiness. And so mm -hmm. even when there's sense of, you know, lack of, lack of sleep with the girls or, um, you know, the, the weekend kayaking trip that I'd hoped to do gets put on hold because one of your kids gets sick and mm. all of these sort of things, it, you just in that moment, it's like, okay, but I'm still doing the things. I'm still living the life that I want to do. So mm. I, I'm, I'm still in that trajectory. I'm still in that, that forward momentum. And I think when you can continually be moving in that direction, mm. then balance crazy life, trying to fit it all in. It, it, it allows you to be comfortable with that, that situation and where you're headed and not get, not beat yourself up. on like, Oh, I wanted to do this business idea or I wanted to do more of this. or I want to, mm. you know, do all the ideas that we have and we get a little disheartened sometimes. And I'm like, and I do it all the time. I think, ah, oh, shit, I wanted to, do this or I said that I'm going to do this for a long time and it doesn't mm. happen. But then when I sit back and actually assess everything else that I've done, I go, no, I've actually achieving a lot or I'm getting a lot done. So mm. I think it's just making, being really clear on, on what drives and what makes an individual happy and where they want to go. And I think if you're continually moving in that direction, no matter how busy or crazy your life gets, it's still, um, you're feeling like you're you're moving in the right direction. So essentially, there's no such thing as balance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how so how old are your kids? 
Uh, Sequoia is five or turning five. And then Aspen is um, turning two at the end of the year, both at the end of the year. So, yeah. Still young. Still very young. Uh, We had kids a little bit later. I'm I'm 43, so kind of on that that later side. Mm -hmm. Um, We talk about a a third, but I think the compromise might be a dog instead. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I couldn't. mm. I've had this discussion with my partner and two's enough. Two is uh, enough, and they're, yeah. they're they're similar age to you. So Lily is uh, not to you, to your kids. Lily is no. f- four, and Noah's two. Oh, right. So okay. yeah, they're going through a bit of a a growth phase right now, which is uh, they've just leveled up into beautiful humans and chaotic, yeah. chaotic mm. humans. <laughs> uh, which you know, this is a perfect um, segue into you know. With family and that and, and surrounding with family, you said, so going through what we were talking about, um, you know, on Instagram and that, you said you were going through a growth phase. Now, that that intrigued me because a, a growth phase, you know, in the past year, especially with COVID and whatnot, can mean many different things. It, you know, it can, it can be with ultra running or, you know, training or anything like that. So what was your growth phase because that that stood out a lot because i haven't heard someone say that for a very very long time mm. especially in my you know what i'm doing with the podcast and you know when you said growth phase i was like that's nice that i really really like that so yeah what, what what's a growth phase to you because again you do so much like for mm. you what is that there was for everything that i do do and the busy life and everything that i've achieved there's been a an underlying sense of uh, I could do more. And it's not necessarily about uh, a greater output. It's I wanted more of an efficiency about what I was doing. Mm. And over the years, there's been self-help books, there's been courses, there's been apps, there's been all of these tools and mechanisms to try and be more productive, to try and uh, utilize or or get the most out of my day and and achieve and do the things that I want to do. And there became a point where I realized that all of those things were external, uh, external tools and mechanisms to try and get more out of who I am. Mm. And really what I needed to do was actually work out what was happening inside and and who I was as a person before I could utilize the the apps and the you know the the time management tools and self-help books. And a friend of mine uh she recommended uh this therapist in um she's in Melbourne actually. And so it's all via Zoom. And through my acting training, I, I've done a lot of self-development, uh, self, uh, looking at, your, at yourself and who you are as a kid. And, and it was probably, it must have been around 28, I started going to a counsellor and then I was doing these. Um, Susan Batson is the uh, acting teacher or coach method, I should say. Uh, and you do a lot of discovery about your child and who you are as a, as a young boy. Um, and that was sort of the start of that self-discovery. Mm. And then so the, that initiated that, that thought and that, that way of thinking. And then it got fast forward to sort of most recently, I was like, that's the work that I need to do. I, I really need to go deep into who I am, what's my shame look like? Where, where's my mm-hmm. trauma mm-hmm. live? How is that playing out in my everyday life? What are my defense mechanisms? What's my tragic flaw? All of these uh, character traits and behaviors that we uh, we become, oh, I became unconscious to. I wanted to have a, an awareness and a consciousness about it. So I started seeing this therapist who was amazing. Um, Danella is her name. And she really helped me appreciate uh, the growth that I have done and started 
dissecting my childhood relationships with my parents. Mm. And then very quickly I was like, okay, this is the path that I need to be on. And it was like, I need more of this. And then Mm. the more I knew, the more I realized that I didn't know. (laughs) And then I was like, okay, this is just, you know, perpetual cycle now. And so from that point on, it was just a, another expansion. And then I joined a men's group and mm-hmm. my therapist originally, she said, Oh, have you thought about a men's group? Like, well, men's group I, it sounded too religious or culty kind of feel. And I was like, so I wasn't that interested in it. And then um, a friend of mine, her boyfriend was, uh, was in one. And so I asked to join his and uh, that they, they weren't taking any more on, but it turns out their men's group fell apart. And so I ended up sort of starting this other men's group mm. with, with this other friend. And so now we've got a, a little men's group that we meet weekly and it's mm-hmm. just via zoom, but it's been such a, a life-changing experience. The, the, men, the men's group. The men's group. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it really has allowed me a, a, a platform to share weekly what's going on internally and Mm. week to week it changes. And then there's maybe bigger issues. I talk about individually for myself when I'm in the men's group. And so the growth phase that I've been on has been looking at all of my individual relationships with my, with my mum, with my stepdad, Mm. with my real dad, uh, with my sister and I've had to identify and, and what those relationships look like. And I've had to have very hard confronting relationships with each of those people. Mm. And it's been, it was, I concluded my work. I was, it was four people. It was my mum, my dad, my stepdad, and my sister. Like four people that I wanted to have you know, the, 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 the conversation or the talk, you know, it's when you hear of all these people passing away suddenly and something, it's like, I wish I just said these things. Mm-hmm. Basically what I did is every one of those conversations with those people, it was, I, I just said everything that I'd ever thought and felt in that relationship with that person. And I was able to just sort of let it all go. And mm, that's beautiful. It was such a, it is by and far the hardest thing I've mm. ever had to do. And mm. I sat on it. It took me six months to to achieve it, uh, mm. get enough courage to do it. Uh, a lot of the main thing that I had to do was kind of express how I felt in that family environment, what, what I saw, how I saw myself within that, the family environment. And I realized a lot of my, I had shame around my intelligence in my family uh, environment. So around my mum, my stepdad, my sister, I had shame around how I perceived my level of intelligence around them because they were quite studious and I'm not, Hmm. I wasn't really a studious person. Um, And so I had to really sit in that uncomfortable position, identify and express how I felt about that shame. Um, and part of that shame and that intelligence was had learning difficulties as a kid growing up. I had ADD. Uh, recently, and part of the other growth, I've never I never got diagnosed, and school was always a real struggle for me. And I was restless, and um, I just didn't thrive in that uh, sc- uh, classroom environment. I was m- mm. much more of a doer and learning on the go. Mm. And so, part of that journey. And that growth was like, okay, why is it the concept of learning and, and sitting down and reading a book, um, being by myself, learning something out of a textbook has always been quite traumatic. Hmm. Oh, and, so, okay. <laughs> yeah. and so this is it's kind of like a broader picture of it, how everything felt like sort of comes together. But through my therapist was like, okay, looking at education, looking at my um, fear of, uh, of reading in public, um, like paralyzed fear with uh, spelling in front of public in people, you know, simple words. I would just freeze if I couldn't, if I had to spell it in front of someone like mm. writing on a board. And my therapist said, I 
and I'd never been tested for ADHD or dyslexia. And she's like, have you ever been tested? I said, I think I've got dyslexia and ADHD. And she goes, have you been tested? And I'm like, no, I've, I've never been tested. She's like, well, go and get tested, mm. you know, try to get some clarity around what you're doing. So, and I recently just finished, I had to go, you know, do all these tests and, and whatever, but again, getting more clarity and growth and understand awareness was like okay what is what definitively uh, who am i as a person and it turns out that i didn't have i don't have dyslexia i do have adhd which is a learning difficulty and so all of a sudden you're creating a, a, a much more i'm creating much of a more of a, a framework that i can understand who i am and, mm. and why i behave in a particular manner and uh and and how that played out as a kid within my family, with my mum, with my stepdad, uh, and and acknowledging and recognizing that I wasn't, I didn't get the love and support that I needed as a young boy to nurture that learning difficulty and mm. find another way to make learning an enjoyable experience. Because now as an adult, I do like to learn when I'm you know, in a classroom environment, but at home in front of a textbook and, and studying the traditional term of it is, you know, borderline still traumatic. It's like, oh, it's I don't know, not many people. There's only a handful of people that I think genuinely really like that kind of studying. But for me, it was mm. just such a, a hard thing. So this whole growth journey that I've been on, it, it's trying to understand all those bits and pieces how they come together how they inter interplay um and where where i can um, focus my attention on more to to achieve mm. the things that i want to do and get the most out of my life because i do I, I love my life and i've got i've done lots of things and uh i think i've got you know fairly unique the life experience mm. and i just want to share that more i want to get more out of it and I, I want to make sure that my legacy that i leave for my girls is a strong one and i think the best thing i can do for myself now is to continually dive down this this rabbit warren of, mm. of who i am as a person and how i can improve and how can i be a better father for my girls and you know it's a, mm. it's a ever evolving uh, yeah. dialogue. It's never the same. Like it, it's you know what you just unpacked there, and like thank you for sharing that because you know it takes a lot to say you know to go through and and you know bring those memories back. So yeah. you know you you said something. So what what I'm gonna go back to first of all, I think you've got to be the legacy for yourself as well. Never mm. forget you and. You know, I know with that, like, uh, I've got a few friends with ADHD and they always, they're always they always doing things and they forget about themselves. So mm. the way I go, I, 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 I focus that on you now is that you have now recognized that about yourself that you need to, you know, work on yourself to and essentially leave that legacy, yes, for your children, but, but for you. Mm. And it mm. seems like you've now, you've anchored yourself to this growth phase. And I don't think that's going to leave you. I think there's a, and not, not in a, you know, um, a sense of I'm, I'm going to continue to grind, 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 grind. I think it's more of a elegant spiritual self-healing journey, which again, there's a part of that self-healing journey I want to get into, um, with you especially. Yeah. Um, but we'll get into the, the, the trigger warning later, but you know, you said something about the, the men's group and that, do, do you think that, you know, there's a correlation between how you, you know, opened up in this men's group to you opening up and telling your family or, or being confident enough to talk to your family about, you know, the things that you've always wanted to say? Unequivocally, yes. It's like I couldn't, there's no way I could have come up with the courage to, mm. to confront. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, it was such a, a daunting task that had I not reached out for counseling, had I not been in the men's group, I wouldn't have had that ability to, to ask and sit and be in that 
uncomfortable mm. position. I think that's <clears throat> why so many people, um, I think is really where the magic is for people. They need to really look at themselves and, and confront the, the, the dark parts of their personality and who they are as a person. Mm. And I think when people go there, they're able to, to really get the growth that they need and, and become the people they need. But it's by and far the hardest thing Fuck, yeah. I think anyone can, mm-hmm. you know. It, so, so, so it was so poignant the, for me to make the, so my stepfather was the hardest one. We don't have we have a we have a good relationship. We don't have a close relationship. I have a lot of jealousy with um, my sister and his love for her mm-hmm. growing up. And there's seven, almost eight years difference between my sister and I. So it was that jealousy was um, was very you know so eight or nine I'm sort of having these experiences and I already didn't have a close relationship with him mm-hmm. as a father my step my dad um, we didn't really you know it was maybe once a month we saw each other it, there was a phase there where it was bi-weekly and I'd catch up with him on the weekends but again you know I mean my dad's a lovely guy and he, he does he loves the drink and loves to go to the footy and so it was like when I got older, it was we'd go to the footy together. But when I wanted to have these conversations and confront and talks, my stepfather was was the hardest one because I've never had a, a meaningful or a deep and meaningful conversation with him ever. And and so to, I knew what I wanted to say, mm. and I wanted to say it not because. I wanted him to feel bad or to make him understand what I was going through or, you know, make him aware. I think if people mm. want to do these conversations, it's not a, you can't come at, come at the conversation as I want you to know what you did to me. Mm. It's <laughs> I'm, I'm want to express what I, my, what my experience was mm-hmm. not for you, but so I can heal and, I think when you can come at the conversation with that mentality and that way of thinking, then you're able to have those <clears throat> conversations and it's not about mm-hmm. blaming that, that parent or person. Anyway, so to to kind of prepare myself for this conversation, one of the gentlemen from men's group, uh, he does tea ceremonies. Mm-hmm. So I he talked about doing a tea ceremony with his dad and his mum and it broke down the the barriers with his with his parents and i was like i'm i'm going to do this now i was inspired by his story and i reached out to him i said could we do a tea ceremony and i'd like to talk about my anticipation of this call with my stepfather mm. what am i going to say how am i going to say it mm. and so we went i went to his house we tea ceremony basically you'll you'll pour three cups of tea mm. and you don't say anything you just sit there in silence for the first three cups of tea and then after the third cup then you just let the conversation sort of happen naturally but uh, you sit there and one and so we talked about it and we're just sort of fleshing the, the concept and the idea and how i felt about it what could go wrong what what might go wrong? What what's my perception of the conversation going to look like? How do I what to feel after the conversation? And so I was what I was really struggling with initially was that basically um, piggyback on what I just said. I didn't want to have the conversation and, and sort of have him feel attacked. Like mm. I was saying, oh, you weren't there for me as a father. You didn't do this. Mm. You didn't help me here. And so through my conversation in the tea ceremony with Aman, he was able to share perspective because my stepfather didn't have a father either. And so you realize, there you go. And he was able to share shed a perspective on the conversations. Like I was doing all this work about self-love, about nurturing between um, uh, in the men's group. And Aman came up with this idea. He said, by you doing this conversation, by you reaching out to your stepfather, 
is a gesture of love and connection to your stepfather. And you're actually allowing, giving him the experience of what it feels like to have masculine love from another person. Mm. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, yes, it's even though it's going to be difficult, even though it's going to be hard, I'm going to be able to express myself from a place of love and share love to my stepfather. And so all of a sudden, the um, the feeling of guilt or feeling bad that I was going to have this conversation was reframed. And I was like, this is going to be a, an experience where I'm going to share something with him and I'm going to give my stepfather love. And it was horrific. <laughs> it was so hard. I Part of my therapy uh, recommendation was to read to my stepfather. So I was, uh, he knew because I had my, did my conversation with my mum first. So he kind of had a heads up that it was, you know, I was calling and we'd text and I said, organize a time. And so I had to, uh, we got on the call and then, so part of my therapist's suggestion was to read to my stepfather. And so I read to all my family members mm. as well, because I was part of my shame and, and getting over my shame about mm. my level of how my intelligence. Um, and I, I've done theater and I've done Shakespeare. So mm, that's yeah, what I'm like trying I to figure out. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like I can't read, but there is this block and there is this uh, self judgment that, that occurs when I'm reading. I'm not a fantastic reader, but I can absolutely read and, and mm. do all the, the things that I have. So I had to sit in my shame and then, and then read these p- passages to my stepfather. And it was just, you know, I think the first 15 minutes was just me just, you know, welling up and, uh, and just being in that emotion and being in that state. But, it was at the end of it, I was just, uh, I was exhausted and not, but it was by and far one of the most, if not the most um, life-changing experience I've ever done. Yeah, and, and like uh, the, the beautiful thing about that is, you know, if you didn't go to that men's meeting and, and you know, it, it brings it back to when we first started the podcast, you know, it's connection. It's, it's having these opportunities, you know, if you don't say yes, you'll never know. You know, you, mm. through this, you found found this guy and through this person, that men's group broke up and you ended up making one. And then because of these people that joined, you finally had the courage to do that. And, you know, what is it where, when when the student is ready, the teacher appears, you know, you, you've you've asked for help from the universe you've you've looked at and you know the previous podcast i had on we were talking about going into the unknown you know this men's group is the unknown stepping Mm. into that growth phase not in the sense of you know nine to five hustle hustle make make money really that that self-growth that we're all essentially looking for and you know you've done that you've stepped into that and that's that's a very powerful thing you know like my experience with um only issue with the the men's group I did was the timing, so mm. you know, and this is where I want to take this to a you know a a step, a step further down. Um, when I did, uh, shout out to Jacob O'Neill. He's been on the podcast as well. Um, he's a, he's a spiritual spiritual man. He's he's a he he holds men's groups. He holds men for who they are. Um, he's a healer, an amazing guy. He invited me along, you know, for free for this uh, Shambhala warrior thing. And I, at the start, I was a bit woo-woo about it. Like, you know, this is a bit uncomfortable. And I'm I'm with 25-odd people on Zoom. Never met them, never seen them, never, ne- never heard of them before. And, uh, you know, this, this, so, so, this circle, they called it. No one spoke, only one person spoke at a time and no one was allowed to say anything back. And Jacob would, you know, go, all right, Adam, it's your turn to speak. You've got three minutes. What's what's playing with you? And he'd talk for three minutes and everyone would go, yep, cool. Go to the next person. So I was allowing people to express themselves. And I remember sitting there and went, fuck it, I'm taking the leap. And this is what, you know, this, again, this is a trigger warning for everyone. It was the first time I admitted to myself, to everybody on this, this random Zoom meeting 
you know, that, that again, trigger warning for everyone, you know, I was sexually abused as a kid. This is where I want to take it to that next level. Um, and tears, tears running down my face. Like, not not from the, the trauma, but from the release. Yeah. This, this I, I've, I've, you know, had this tap. My, my bath was overflowing and I finally turned it off and it was just this, oh, this just, in front of 20, 20, 20 random people. Mm. And, you know, I left it and no one said anything. That, that was the beautiful thing about it. I had to sit with that for the rest of the session because, you know, I wanted to quit and get off it, but I went, no, I'm going to sit with it. Started crying. You know, next, uh, we got off, went to, you know, the meeting, the meeting finished. And because of what I said, the amount of people that messaged me after through Facebook and saying, thank you so much for that because I've been dealing with the same thing. I'm talking out of the, 25, there was 10 people that messaged me, mm. said, you've now given permission for me to talk about this. Mm. And that that's all it took. And, you know, that's how I relate that back to your story. It's all it took was for someone to guide you, for someone to mm. give you permission to go on your journey. And now mm. I've given 10 random people permission to talk about theirs. Now, mm. you know, we I, I don't put particularly want to go into too much detail as such with that. But, you know, you've had the exact same experience as me. Um, mm. Now, how does... I know how it shaped me as a kid. Mm. You know, when I when I finally admitted to it, funnily enough, my best mates, I've got five group of mates from school, mm. all of them sexually abused, all of them. Mm. And then... I, I was so surprised when I finally came out and spoke to them and I said, hey, this is what's happened. They went, oh, yeah, same. I was like, what? Really? <laughs> yeah, like, it, it's so... And this is the thing, it's so fucking common and it's fucking horrendous. You know, and for me personally, I know how it's shaped me, especially, you know, with addiction to pornography and how I used to see myself as just being dirty, tainted. Always felt tainted, always felt a bit yuck. Um, and finally, you know, I did the healing and I've, I've, I had to have that conversation with random people. I, I just came to, I'm not going to say I loved it, but to go, that is what happened to me, but this is what ha- This is what I'm going to do and this is what's happening to me now. I'm not going to let that, you know, because that's the past. So yeah. for you, how, how did that shape you? Like what? Have, did you talk about it or because I think this is a very important but hard conversation to have especially on a you know podcast mm. yeah it's really unfortunate uh, that it does happen as much as it does I think that it's just it really is one of the the uh, stains on society you know, that this, this kind of stuff happens. And I, I, it's like, it's just a, a filthy stain. And it, it, my experience for me was, it was really lonely. Mm. It was a lonely experience. Uh, I had stepfather who I didn't have a, a good connection with. Um, my dad wasn't in the picture after it happened. Uh, this is like early eighties. I think it was not particular when it was exactly, but, uh, around that time and it happened quite you know, a handful of times before I actually told my mom, I was like, Hey, you know, I don't want to, she would do it at a, at a, at a aerobics, like at a squash center. And it happened. That's where it happened. And, and it probably happened a handful of times before I kind of mentioned it to my mum. And of course my mum called the police straight away and they came over. And I remember sitting in my bedroom on the, on the toy box and having these two police officers uh, ask me questions about what happened, um, 
what was, you know, what exactly went on. And then they left and that was it. Never spoken about again, never addressed. There was never any form of reflection. It was nothing. It was just, that was it. And that was part of my growth recently having that conversation was like with my mom, I was like really sitting down with my mom and we talked about it a little bit, but not extensively. Mm. And, and so with my conversation with my mom that I had, I really went into, I was like, what happened? Like, why, why wasn't there any counseling? What did he ever get caught? What? And the advice from the police was, don't talk about it. That was their suggestion. Oh, the fuck's that? Yeah. Yeah. So it was just, and that time, and it was just swept under the carpet, you know, it's like, try not to let it affect, you know, no talk about it. So then, you know, hopefully it goes away. And so I, I was around six, six or seven. So you're six or seven, you've got ADHD, you're sexually abused. You don't have a, a stepfather or a strong role father figure. Dad's not around. And here you are in a, an environment of education where you've got to sit at a desk oh, all day lonely. and mm. and try to make the most of your learning experience. And so, of course, I was distracted and and last thing I wanted to be to be doing was to be in that environment. I needed I needed mask. I needed to feel protected and. Mm. And that is, that is my, uh, that is my uh, um, kryptonite in terms of when I think about it as my boy, like my little self, mm. he just wanted to be protected. He wanted to have a dad and he wanted to feel love from a male. And you're going to get me teary right now because yeah. I, I just, I've, in a good way, I feel it. I know. I know that. I know what you're saying, and I feel it. I feel it. I really do. Mm. And so, with the with the experience, it, it represents quite uh, very different emotional states. Mm. There's the state of. And, and I'm so attuned to this now through, through my acting work. So, you know, sometimes you've got to get angry in a scene. You've got to, you know, get after it. And, and one of the tactics that I do, and it's because I've done so much work on this now and I'm, uh, I'm so comfortable with it, but I think about my little self being taken advantage of and that guy and the anger and the stain. And I can, like, I can elicit some like just horrific level of rage where I would comfortably punch a hole in a wall, like of anger. And mm -hmm. so I use that going into a, a scene and, you know, it, the feeling is, is, is visceral. And that's what, act, you know, good acting is about. It's like bringing your experience and your knowledge and your, mm -hmm. my life as Adam and adding that to the character, you know, you, you make you, it's an interpretation of that character. So, that is one element of it. And then there's the other element of just pure like, horrific sadness and, you know, like just wailing like a baby and, and crying about it happening mm. and not having a dad and the sadness that that brings and not being protected and that little boy. Mm. And just by speaking it now, you, you know, I go to that, that place of emotion and uh, and memory of it, and there's this sadness, and you know I can even hear it in my voice. It's like drops and slow down, and and you just there's a stillness and a, a sadness about it. And then there's the other part of it, which is as weird as it sounds. It's like almost happy, all that. Like, Gr grateful that mm -hmm. I had to go through that experience mm -hmm. because now it, it, it's provided a, a level of richness to my, to my life and a perspective that allows me to connect with other people, with other men mm -hmm. and, and the work that I'm doing now and, uh, and the men's group and, 
and having these conversations, you realize that there's so many other people out there, so many other men that have never even explored their trauma or their journey. And every time I have a conversation with someone, there's always someone going, coming up to me after or, or wanting to know more about it or uh, you do a social media post about my, my counselling or my men's group and there's always a follow-up question from someone. And so for me, that is the, the big takeaway take from, from my experience is I've now created a, a narrative of the story that I'm comfortable with mm-hmm. and I can speak quite frankly and up and openly about mm. my experience and not and not affect me like i can tell mm. other people and other people have been like wailing in you know, tears and crying mm. about it and i'm like almost kind of you know shut off from that that experience mm. because i'm just saying it and i've said it so many times but then if i want to drop into those that mm. feeling i i can the biggest the the other thing that with my experience was and i never thought about this and this is it, it, it's kind of the the punctuation point or the exclamation mark of the whole experience came three months ago when i had the con- uh, my conversation with my dad so my dad was the last person that i had the conversation with um my dad's father was an alcoholic Mm. um and i part of the conversation with my dad was trying to find out who he was as a boy did he have troubles with his learning and so we had this kind of conversation my dad's a real joke he's a lot like he's such an amazing guy and everyone loves him and in that conversation my my lead up to to it all with mum, I say, did, did dad know what happened to me as a boy? And she's like, I don't think so. And I'm like, well, mm. if you didn't tell him, no one else would have told him. So that was that was kind of the the last uh, element of that of of that whole sexual abuse experience was telling my dad. And so in this conversation, it happened, you know, a couple of months ago. I let my dad know at the age of 43 that his son was sexually abused as a, as a kid. And my dad is, is quite an emotional person as well, but he wailed like a baby. Like he was, he, he was just devastated. It mm-hmm. was like I'd, I'd been, like I died. And to be there and witness that level of emotion that he went through and now as a parent, mm. what it would feel like for one of my daughters to tell me 20, year, tw- you know, 20 years or so after something had happened and I never knew would just be gut-wrenching. Mm. And I hadn't anticipated what it would, his reaction and what that perspective would be like. Um, And so when I told him there was this sudden uh, sadness for my dad about what he was having in that Mm. moment, it was like, oh, shit. And so extremely hard confronting Mm. all of those things, what you, you would expect, but it was remarkable for me. Like it, it lifted this sense of loneliness because I shared with my dad, like the one, my DNA, my, mm. you know, my true father. And I shared this experience with him. And even though I caused him so much hurt and pain in that moment, it released so much from me mm. and it built a, a bond between us that now when we have conversations dad's actually kind of interested in <laughs> what's going on you know mm. my dad's kind of like oh you've been up to son you know oh, 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 good chatting to you see ya mm. you know whereas he's now he's 
elaborating on his life and, and kind of sharing more about what he's doing at home and what he's up to and just a, a far more wholesome and relatable conversation. And, and the thing, because, sorry to cut you off there, you yeah. did that. Mm. You know, you you had the fucking guts mm. to step out into, this is just for the audience as well, you had mm. the guts to step into that unknown and to talk to that group. And if it wasn't for that, these things wouldn't, have happened and now look how beautiful it is you know from a third person angle listening in it's like that's all it takes that's ain't sorry to continue it's just uh, this is a this is a real this is a beautiful beautiful story yeah no i th- it, it it is and i'm kind of in this experience now with my wife who she's adopted and I remember when I met her, I was like, oh, so have you done lots of, because I did a little bit of count, a fair bit of counseling when I was a kid. Mm. So I'm quite op- open to it. So I, um, I said to her, I was like, have you had counseling? And she's like, no. I was like, you've done no reflection work, therapy work on the fact that you're adopted. And she's like, no. And I, and you know, this is your, your wife. This is the, you know, this person that you love and, and you just want the most best for them. So I've been, you know, on this journey and self-development and growth and all this sort of stuff. And and I, I'm sort of the whole time I'm trying to encourage my wife to to get involved. And she's like, oh, nothing's wrong with me. You know, like everything's fine. And, you know, and I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe could we, you know. It, and it's it's my fiance to a T. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think when you once you and because it's hard work and people don't want to do it, and so I get it. it and so that's kind of the the funny funny part. I think when people say uh, I don't need to, I'm okay, everything's right, then they're the people that you know mm-hmm. definitely need to be doing something. And even if you think that everything is okay, the reality is the mind and your subconscious and your behavior, there are things that I think the more knowledge you have about your unconscious behavior, uh, what are your reactions? What are your triggers? Once you start having a vocabulary or a, a vocabulary or a roadmap of who you are as a person, you can appreciate when you get stressed, when you get, you know, why you, get get road rage or mm. when your your partner asks you to empty the dishwasher and you know you go yeah no worries instead of having this defensive mechanism i'm like well i'm not going to do it now because you've asked me mm. you can create you, you can better function in in the world because you have context of who mm. you are as a person and not just being reactive to every situation um with, with your wife do you think you know it, it, now this is just a different perspective because I from from my view with my my partner, you know, that she's had a very rough rough upbringing uh, in the sense of just a very nasty divorce between both parties. Won't get into that, um, you know. And I I I got her into therapy. Um, I said you should you you've got some shit to sort out, and I'm giving you an ultimatum because things got ugly for a bit. You know, it's like we, we, we changed energies. You know, I went through a very, very rough patch and then that sort of energy transitioned to her. She went through a very rough patch and there was an ultimatum there to get better. And she did. She did a few sessions and it just didn't hit for her. But what I noticed, because of the work I'm doing with the podcast, because of the mental health thing I'm, you know, I'm doing, I've noticed her sort of question herself when she does blow up. I've noticed mm. her, you know, just have a different perspective of things. And maybe for some people, I know for her especially, that, that's enough. That is enough. They'd, you know, as you as you just said, it's a hard journey. And if both, to be honest, if both parents are going on that journey at the same time, I'd... <sighs> That I I don't think it would work, you know. So I think you know for it. Uh, I don't know your relationship with your partner, but is is there a possible or possibility that you know because you are doing the work, she's also now going, she's piggybacking off that subconsciously and maybe asking, 
do I need to, you know, do I need to go back there and go through through those mm. those traumas and whatnot? Um, so yeah, again, I think what you're doing with everything and everything you who who you are as a person, I think that what you've just said with everything it's beautiful like it's a it's a beautiful story and like you know we haven't even gotten into you know tahoe 200 and the ultra running side of things which we will but you know it's you've done a lot and you're doing a lot but it's all for you and you're showing up for yourself i you we, we always like for me i always use the the cliche thing of you know showing up for your children and but really, am I? No, I love my children. I'm going to be the best I can, no matter fucking what. I'm going to show them the life that they're worth. You know, that's that's a given. And I, but I always go, oh, you know, I'm going to show them how to get through a hard time. Like, no, 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 no. I'm doing that for me. Mm. You know, and and you know, to, to put just go back to this, what you were talking about of having that masculine father figure. I have that. You know, have it, have, being held. That's my biggest thing, being held. I never received that. Mum, Dad, if you're listening, you, you gave me a great life, but I wasn't held emotionally. <laughs> <laughs> I was never held emotionally, ever. Yeah. And I was always searching for that externally. I read all the self-help books, how to, you know, mm. hug yourself. I, I've done I've done all that. I've done it, all, as you said, external. It was all external. And when I went to my psychologist... She re- she taught she just light bulb moment a big aha moment was she goes Kent you're never gonna be held and you you're too old you're not gonna be held mm. and I was like what why not because it's past that you you're not a, you're not a kid anymore so we did an exercise and I I went to my inner child mm. and I closed my eyes and I she said picture your inner child um, what are you gonna say to him when you know the sexual abuse happened. I give him a hug. I might just do that. For, you know, we, we sat there, and then she made me hug myself. Mm. She made me fully put my 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 my, my love language is touch. I love just touch. So, mm. I hugged myself, and then I I think it's against the rules of you know, psychology. But she got up, and she could see how touched like hurt I was, and she gave me a hug. And I don't think psychologists are allowed to do that. So it was a massive mm. like. She cares, and as soon as that that care, I I knew someone gave a shit about me, because mm. you know you were saying it's lonely, that you know what you said is it's a fucking lonely lonely path, and to have a random person give me a hug was like, oh, I felt like a kid again. I felt like mm-hmm. I was loved. I was emotionally being held, and then from that moment on, I know I knew how to regulate myself, and. You know, I think we're all looking for that masculine. I don't think we'll ever get it. You know, we. I want to be held emotionally, but I have to hold myself emotionally. That's mm. what I have to do, and that's the fuck. I don't. I'm. I'm still figuring that out. It's better than what it was before. It's not perfect, but you know, I have a. Fa- I've got a father, but again, was never. If I wanted to talk about how I was feeling, it was sort of like, oh, okay, yep, 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 yep. That's uncomfortable for me. Go away. Mm. So now I've got to do that for me. And that's a personal thing. And I think we're all, you know, you, I think you and me is, uh, are similar in many, many ways, but different worlds apart. Um, but, you know, you even said it. It's a, it's a never-ending journey. It is a never-ending journey. And we, you know, this is non-stop till the day we die. And... Mm. That's the beautiful thing about life. That is the beautiful thing about our healing journey is that we're continuously growing. Again, not in a cynical sense of hustle, grind. It, it's this beautiful journey of self-discovery. Mm. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, no, it's true. It's Because yeah. it's I think that, that this whole pursuit of, um, you know, what is happiness? Where... What is uh, what does it mean to be wealthy? You know, all of these mm. things uh, we think about, and I, and it truly is. When the time comes, and when we are, you know, on our deathbed, it's like, what did what did you actually do as a person, and, and how do you how do you know yourself, and what are the relationships around you like, and was it enriched with 
connection and conversation and laughter and love and, and, and passion. You know, these are all things that really excite me and, you know, I want to get the most out of. Um, so, and I think it is, I, I really think that that is the, the mm. if society as a whole could really have that sense of intention to better know each cell our, ourselves, then I think everything would, would, would be a happy family mm-hmm. around the world. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. yeah. So look, I know, I know we're, we're pretty precious on time. Um, I just want to, I want to change gears and pivot. I think we, we've gone deep enough and I'm, I'm yeah. so, look, I'm just going to say I'm really, really grateful that, you know, when you click with someone and they just get it, that's mm. you. You know, I, when, when ever can you just, you know, I guess you do the, the men's meetings, but you know, to, to be able to do this with you on the other side of the world and to have a deep, com- to, to have a rich conversation like that to unpack some shit because I know I'm going to finish this and I'm going to go, oh, I feel a bit better. I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to feel good. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to feel good. And I'm just going to say now, I really appreciate you, you being vulnerable like this because it's fucking hard. It's hard. You know, you're in LA, I'm on the Gold Coast. We're completely different. You know, it's what, four, four o'clock in the afternoon here. It's 9.45 here, you know, and we're able to do this. And that's, again, a part of this journey and why I do this podcast because someone gets to listen to this and they're going to take bits and pieces that they're going to take with them for the rest of their life. Um, so, again, first of all, I just I appreciate it. I really, really do. No, good to be here. So, okay, this is where I'm... This is my forte. This is where I, what I love. You've run two out of the three... Uh, destination trail, massive ultra trails. So, mm-hmm. to 380 kilometers and 320 kilometers, um, and you finish both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What were the, what were the times for those? Do you know? Uh, Moab was 98 hours, and then Tahoe was. Uh, seventy-two, I think. Yeah. Uh, that's what three, nearly three days. Yeah, Mo- yeah. Moab was almost four days, and then mm-hmm. Tahoe was yeah three and a bit days. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm kind of again just very random. Always loved. Uh, sport and being active and and sort of pushing myself to the limits and then I've done an Ironman and I did a couple of other ultra you know I did uh, Oxfam mm-hmm. once when I was early 20s so I'm like I'm a runner per se but I'm not uh, running is mm-hmm. not the only thing I've ever done I do, mm-hmm. do CrossFit and um, I've just done lots of different things anyway and so I remember being at home going Look, and I think the advertisement came. I was like, oh, 200 miles. I was like, I think to my, to my wife, I, said, I think I want to do this because this actually looks like a race that <laughs> could, like, maybe I won't finish it. You know, this actually mm-hmm. looks like mm-hmm. it's going to be really hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not just a 24 hours or a 10 hour race where you go, well, at the end of the day, it's just a long day. Mm-hmm. You know, this is multiple days mm-hmm. and could you finish it? So, Moab was. First time I'd ever done that kind of thing. I had no, as much research as you can do, there's no preparing for a race like that, truly. It's oh, like you, just yeah, gotta, yeah. you just got to do it. Um, so that was, Moab was really hot. First day one, it was high, th- you know, I think it almost got up to 41, you know, like 100 degrees. Mm. Uh, so it was stifling hot, no shade. Uh and so that was day one, just kind of got me off at a bad start and I was cramping. And mm. at that point, it was just very slow. Uh, but it was an amazing experience and journey. And then literally as soon as I finished it, Moab, I was like, no, I'm doing that again. Like, mm. I'm definitely mm. going again. And then uh, Tahoe, 
I was able to obviously use the experience I had from Moab and things like aid stations. You know, I tried to keep my aid stations down to 15 to 20 minute um, stops Mm -hmm. because I spent too much time in Moab sitting down and and really Mm. enjoying my breaks. So just simple things like that. Um, uh, And Tahoe was another experience where I was like, okay, I wanted to kind of push it a little bit more and see where I could go. And there was a moment there where I was, you know, thinking maybe I'm going to get into the top 10 and then everything sort of went backwards mm. really quick. And mm. uh, I had a chest infection and then I had, so, you know, and this is the game, isn't it? You you know all the right things, but then I had a, I put a pair of socks on that were too tight around my ankles mm. and I started, I cut off the blood flow and then mm-hmm. obviously if you're on your feet for so long, your feet swell. So then I felt like I had these really bad, what I thought were shin splints. Hmm. But then when I took my uh, sock off, I could see that there was swelling around my sock. Hmm. And so that's what caused it. And then, so things like that uh, hindered the race. But the the races are just these uh, kind of psychedelic experiences for anyone that sort of knows what that's like. Because you just, you're sleep deprived, uh you know you have you're having hallucinations you're seeing things Mm. and tahoe was i mean i've i knew what was happening but at the same time i would you know i was like can you can you see that there's an arab man sitting Mm. on that bench with uh, aluminium foil hair (laughs) you know there was just all these crazy Mm. pictures that i was creating but uh you do you just sort of tap into what's happening physically, emotionally, and you just, it's really surreal Mm -hmm. to, to do those races because you, you have to go to a place where you can stay in the moment, try not to get too carried away with how far you've gone, Mm -hmm. what's next. And you've just got to be in that moment and one foot in front of the other, thinking about your breathing, Mm -hmm. staying relaxed. uh, And you just keep plugging on. Oh yeah, like a there's there's a guy. Um, oh, I, I know him through Instagram. He he just finished the Coca two fifty. Oh yeah, hundred and nineteen hours or something, just under the cutoff. And how he was saying was exactly that. He goes, you know, you've done a hundred miles, and you go, fuck, I've got another hundred and fifty miles. <laughs> you know to go and he's like okay yeah. yep so you don't get caught he was like saying you know you just got to stay in the moment and exactly what you said just the hallucinations you know he he was running but like apparently there was a dog be- beside him but it wasn't it was a bush so he's going, <laughs> yeah. Oh, fuck. so you yeah, know so from a mental mental aspect like what you know i've earned my my longest is 100 kilometers i dnf'd on a recent um, hundred miler just because my partner broke her foot and someone had to take care of the kids. Mm. Uh, plus, I was injured. Um, so, uh, you know, at what point? You know, when you start hurting, when you get to that point, you want to quit. Where, where do you find that transition into the, the next mindset? Like, is there something mm. that you go, "Yep, yeah, I'm going to just just because we all go through the rough patches." But how do you get mm. through the rough patch? It's it's an uh, um, a sense of gratitude and I always look at my health as a privilege. Mm. I, I mm. feel like mm-hmm. I'm privileged to have an ab- to be able-bodied. I'm mm-hmm. privileged to have an opportunity to, to run the races, mm-hmm. to have a support crew there with me. And whenever things got really tough and really hard, I would just sort of take a moment, look around, and I was it'd be saying things like, "These are the memories. These are the moments. Mm-hmm. You could not be here, and you could be at work. You could be in a wheelchair one day. Mm-hmm. And if you could take this moment and really get the most out of it." what would that look like? And it's always a case of this is the place I want to be, irrespective of sleep deprivation, feet hurting, whatever Mm. is happening in the moment. There's always an ability to just say, this is where I want to be. This was a choice. Mm. And 
this is growth. This is a, a journey. And like all things, it will pass. Mm. It will come. And now here I am. Tahoe, they're a distant memory. You know, mm. they're an experience. And, and I think that's what always happens, isn't it? And that's kind of the metaphor for life. It's the the bad times will pass. There will be a time where you will look back and go, that was a really tough time when my mum or dad died or I lost my job or I was bankrupt or whatever the situation is, it will pass and there will be a new time. There will be a new journey. And, and that's just what I kept telling myself. It's like, this will be over. Mm-hmm. Just keep going. Mm-hmm. This is where you want to be. This is the journey. And without this, feeling of, uh, of suffering or this uh, challenge you won't you won't know what it's like to be on the other side and to have that that growth and if you can get through this then no doubt you'll be able to get through other things mm. and and that's probably the correlation for me fitness and training it's just been very natural for for me and it's something that i always love and i love the feeling of exhaustion and pushing my body and Mm. and and going and that has always been uh for me the the metaphor that i can use in other elements of my life Mm. where i'm not so um gifted you know it's like okay just sit down and and do the study or do the the thing that i don't like Mm. to do because it will too pass you know Mm. so I, I try as much as I can to use the the experience of, of those races and, and mm-hmm. training and, and physical exertion as a as a a reflection on what I can actually do. Mm. To get up at three AM in a, on a on a weekend and go run, you know, in the snow. I did mm-hmm. one training run he, here when I was in Utah and it was my my like minus 15 degrees, maybe even colder, Jesus like minus Christ. 15 degrees Celsius, mm. maybe 20, to the point where my eyebrows were freezing and my drink mm. bottle, my gloves were fro- got fro- frozen because mm. they got water on them. So, you know, to be able to to get out of bed and, and do those sort of things, it, there's just this continual resilience that gets mm. built and this uh, knowledge and this confidence is like, yes, I can, I can do this. So, yeah, I, I think for me that's been the real... Uh, benefit of, mm. of doing these races is it, what it illustrates to me is what I can achieve and mm. and how I can use that in, in the other parts of my life. That's great. I oh, know I'm going to use that now. I'm going to use that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so look, I I, I want to round this out. I really, I, I'm, I'm, I just realized I saw what the time was. I could talk forever. Um, <laughs> so I want to end this on what is your message to the world? What what is your your thing? Can be anything, you know. But you know what's resigna- what's res- resonated what's resonated with you in your life and something that you want to pass on for the audience to hear. Uh, I really like the concept of finding joy in your life. Uh, I think understand finding joy in the everyday. Uh, the joy of waking up to your partner, the joy of seeing a bird, a tree, being amazed at the wonders. Like even we, we had some grass been growing here. I'm like, I'm so excited about looking at our, our grass growing. And like, isn't this just amazing? And trying to find as many of those moments where you can appreciate just how how unique we are being this mm. this journey of life and uh just i know a lot of people get in in these ruts where they just hate their life and they hate their job uh and i've been such an advocate of just doing what you enjoy and finding a way to make money from that and and i know you know we've got to save and we've got to retirements and all these sort of things but i think really if we can prioritize enjoyment of life over all other then 
things just become that more that much more enjoyable and kind of gives us a reason to be here so find the joy in lo- in life and then know that the the love and the happiness within your world comes from when you look at yourself the most and once you can uh identify what that looks like then you're able to really live a, a rich and uh, fulfilling life mm. cool i love it man so look i yeah thank i just thank you for your afternoon thank you for your time you've got two kids you know you're going out somewhere tonight and whatnot so yeah it means a lot to be able to do this with you because you know again i do this podcast just for my own sake i like talking to people i like hearing your like stories like yours um you know and i in a way we're all like not in a way we're all fucked up (laughs) we're all every single fucking human on this planet is fucked up in one way or another and it's you know having these conversations these meaningful conversations that just um make it a little bit more easier so i appreciate it pleasure thanks for having me perfect peace thank you thanks